A bare plaster classroom with open beams and an uninsulated ceiling echoes with the scrape and scronk of metal desks being dragged across concrete floors. A broken window clangs shut. There are so many voices, laughter, shrieks, and howls that we are unable to hear the ring of the school bell for all the joyful din. I walk between the desks, a series of connected tables and benches built for two, where three or four students cram together, leaning on one another. Their shaved heads all look alike, cut close to prevent the spread of lice. Girls and boys both wear white collared shirts, the girls with maroon skirts and the boys with gray shorts or slacks. Some of their uniforms are torn. Most are faded from drying in the sun. Half the class is barefoot. 49 students fidget, their dark skin glowing with the sheen of Vaseline and a good long run to school. I look them in the eyes, waiting for silence. Someone whispers in the back. Good morning, I say. Good morning, madame, they chorus. At my request, 98 hands rustle through filmy grocery bags reused until they disintegrate to retrieve their exercise books. I am at Chipangura Secondary School in Zimbabwe, Southern Africa, three miles from the nearest source of electricity and running water where classrooms are in short supply and malaria abundant. As a native English speaker, I am supposed to be an advantage to kids in the bush, where Shona is the primary language. British colonialism left behind an educational system that requires national exams in English every two years. Rural schools are the ugly stepchildren in this context, home to the most apathetic and less, least effective teachers who didn't qualify for positions at coveted boarding schools or comfortable city locations. Nobody wants to teach in the bush. I am assigned four classes of first-year students for my two-year commitment, the idea being that with my instruction, they will increase the pass rate on the national exams. Good scores equal better educational opportunities in the future. I throw myself into teaching. I teach classes of 50 to 60 students, sometimes under a big fig tree in 100 degree weather, the girls sitting on the ground with their legs stretched out straight in front of them, the boys perched on piles of bricks, knobby knees drawn together to make a sort of desk. We act out stories and workshop our writing, and they write incoherent paragraphs with the most beautiful penmanship. My students take notes ever so slowly. Only half of them have rulers, which they pass around and share because they find reasons to underline everything <laughs> with painstaking deliberateness. They put more in effort into making their assignments look smart than ensuring that they are correct. My methods frequently diverge from the Zimbabwean approach, which is largely based on rote memorization and conformity. Kids and teachers alike chant maxims such as, education is the key to life. It is easy to repeat facts and slogans, but I am trying to teach critical thinking and how to make sentences actually say something. I stay up late marking compositions by candlelight, working for hours on feedback to help kids express themselves clearly. But many get upset for the way I mark their papers. I make them look messy. When I explain that the quality of their thinking is more important than the perfection of their handwriting, they frown. <laughs> Discipline and compliance are enforced with corporal punishment. The science teacher whips kids' calves with a siphon for missing assignments. For tardiness or uniform infractions, students are sent to go off and choose a branch for their own punishment. Rulers to knuckles are common motivators. I do none of these. I hope to tap into internal motivation, but usually it just means that I am not respected. Teaching here takes my emotions on a roller coaster. My colleagues include Mr. Makuta, the history teacher, who often returns from his lunch break smelling of chibuku, the local brew. 
He surges towards his lesson, stiff-legged as if walking on stilts, eyes half open, flecks of foam on his upper lip. Mr. Makuta has also managed to snag an older schoolgirl to sleep with, in addition to his unhappy wife. The library I was supposed to establish started out as a pile of mildewy books on the floor of a shed. It's taken months for the administration to decide to build shelves for them. I have only a dozen textbooks. Students share a copy in class, but if I want them to do homework, I must spend part of my half-hour class period allowing them to copy questions from my pitted chalkboard. And tests, they are created on a hand-cranked mimeograph machine yet we frequently run out of the waxy paper needed to create the templates. And cheating and plagiarism are rampant. Still, I fall in love with the kids. I believe in them. Letwin is different. She is a girl with wide eyes and exquisite curiosity. She is incredibly smart and not compliant with cultural expectations for females. Where other girls keep quiet, Letwin participates in class discussions, even disagreeing with the boys. When I start a young writers club after school, she joins some 15 boys who are the most academically gifted and years older than her, and she holds her own. It's the connection with some of the kids that lifts me high. My volleyball boys cheering one another on, mimicking my admonishments to be encouraging, not discouraging. The kids in the art club experiencing for the first time the simple joy of drawing with crayons and pencils on white printer paper. The young writers proudly selling their magazines for a dollar after typing up all their poems, jokes, and stories. The kids who created a traveling drama group and asked me to be their chaperone. It is the closest thing to belonging in a place that isn't home. When it comes time to return to the States, I'm not ready. The Peace Corps commitment is two years, but if the work you are doing is good, your service can be extended. My application to stay another year is approved. A month into my extension, the national exam results arrive. My headmaster hands me a folded piece of paper. Miss, the results are somewhat uh, disappointing. I had hoped that a quarter of the 130 students would pass, which would be excellent for a school like ours. But only five did. Five. That's about a 4% pass rate as compared to 3.2% in previous years. This is the first time I've really failed at anything. My head spins with disappointment. I attempt to make meaning out of something that makes me feel meaningless. I'd put my all into teaching these kids. What happened? What did this say about my teaching? And now I'm here for the rest of the year for what? To continue failing? At night, I pace my tiny room and sob. How can I endure the loneliness, the constant harassment from men, the missing my family and friends back home if there is no purpose in it? And then I decide, I'm going home. I will pay back every penny of this visit to the states that Peace Corps gave me when I extended. I can complete the library by the end of the term and be out of here. I say it aloud between tears and hiccups. I am going home. I take the photos of my family and friends off the wall and stack them on my bed. I am going home. My map of the country comes down next. I fold it and place it on the pile. I am going home. I will call the Peace Corps office tomorrow and find out what I need to do to wrap this up. At lunch, I go to the office to use the school's recently installed phone to call my supervisor. I take a deep breath and dial. It doesn't work. <laughs> Not a surprise, it rarely works. After school, instead of marking papers, I sit on my bed writing a letter to a fellow volunteer about how I am about to quit. 
I described the student with a slack mouth who refused to identify the title of the piece we were reading that day, and the fact that I just killed the fourth scorpion in my house in two weeks. And as I write out my grievances, I hear a knock, knock, knock. I open the door to two of my students, Mildred and Rachel. Rachel extends a plastic bag full of guavas and says, I have brought you your parcel. I smile, thank her, and ask to see her hand. A few weeks earlier, she had sliced the base of her thumb so badly it was nearly severed. Muscle, fat, and pus had oozed from it for a week. When I found out why she was missing school, I gave her the money, the equivalent of two US dollars, and asked Mildred to accompany her to the clinic. Maybe. If I had not been there, no one would have prioritized her hand. After all, she's only a girl. Maybe the money to pay for the antibiotic never would have materialized. Maybe her thumb or hand or arm would eventually need amputation. Maybe not, but maybe. This turns into my oh yeah moment. I am not in Zimbabwe solely for academic reasons, but for the humanity of encounters like this. Maybe I've inspired a few girls to make the most of their learning or provided an alternative to the pervasive apathy and drunkenness. Those things are important. But engaging in the everyday moments of human connection is enough. When I arrived, I wanted to live simply and learn from poverty. I certainly have. I wanted to toughen up to grow. Sometimes growth feels a lot like failure. I wanted to improve the lives of others. Despite their test results, these kids speak English better than any other kids their age in the surrounding region. That's something. The next morning, I walk at dawn, as I often do. In that hour, I am free to clear my head before the day begins, to collect more images for my mental file on rural Zimbabwe. I think I must remember the growing season. Stalks of maize so tall and lush that only the crowns of the grass-thatched huts peek over. The rains that bring beautiful sunrises, clouds lit up all pink and periwinkle. And when the sun passes through that prism of pink, Golden light shoots horizontally across the land, making long, long shadows from the trees, which don't look like shadows at all, but as if the sun merely sent out her radiance like fingers clasping the earth. I never send that letter to my friend. As my service draws to an end, the school throws me a goodbye party, and a few of my students do the planning Letwin and Pepukai serve cake. Elvis and Wellington play DJ with a big boom box hooked up to a bus battery, and we dance. When I head back to my hut, my students follow me up the dirt path as if I am their Pied Piper, singing in harmony and dancing, girls in their colorful wraps and headscarves, boys in their dusty shorts and faded t-shirts. They surround my hut as I sit on the stoop watching them with tears in my eyes. We are not failures. We are amazing. Jessica Petrenzig, everybody. Jessica.